Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. We, you know, we love listener questions here. By the way, Thomas Miller here, and along with Robert Glasscock. And if you go to the funastrology.com website, and up in the upper left-hand corner is an orange button that you can hit and leave us a question. Well, we got a question, but it was very much a personal chart question, which we unfortunately can't do here. However, there was a really good springboard element of it that I thought would be great for Robert and me to discuss here for just a minute, because it it involves how do you synthesize all these elements in astrology without it just literally blowing your mind. There are so many different tangents and rabbit holes that you can go down, and yet what we have here is a guy that's been doing this for 60 years, basically, almost, very successfully across natal readings, solar arc predictive readings, even horary, answering questions in the chart. And this style that Robert teaches is very effective. So one of the elements of this question was kind of what planets or what strengths in the chart are more influential Is it the faster-moving planets? Is it the outer planets? How do we distinguish some of these various things that we could put into the soup, and do we even need them? So, Robert, your thoughts, first of all, on the simplicity of synthesis, and then maybe this division of how do I look at Fast, slow, day, night, malefic, benefic, in fall, in exaltation. How do we cut through all that maze? (laughs) Oh, it's such a great question. I I listened to it um, uh, when you sent it to me. And uh, the the listener was asking about uh, all the differences between is, is Mars stronger in this instance or is Neptune stronger? And she was talking about uh, rulers of night charts and versus day charts and malefics and debilitation and accidental dignities and all of these these different perspectives on astrology. My motto is maybe twofold kiss, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid, uh, which we hear all the time applied in various areas. But it's true in astrology as well. I think the and, and you can easily get lost in trying to take into account all of these minutiae that the books uh, teach, various books. But if you just go back to the basics and stay focused on what is the difference between the moon and Mercury or Venus or Mars and, say, planets like Neptune and Uranus and Pluto, the big difference is the time that they spend in a sign, their motion, their relative motion, apparent motion from the Earth's perspective. Faster moving planets from the moon, let's say the sun, moon, Mercury, um, Venus, Mars especially, are relatively faster moving. And so they spend less time, relatively speaking, in a particular sector of the zodiac or in a particular house. So that their emphasis is different based on that, on the time that they occupy a particular sector. And they have more, quote unquote, strength in terms of longevity and, and say, breadth and depth of uh, effects. So that a planet such as Neptune, which she mentioned, the listener, is absolutely a a collective archetype. So generations of people will be born with Neptune in a particular sign. And it's that relative uh, motion that is important. And you can get, of course, you want to take into account, is, is the planet in a sign that is harmonious with the nature of the planet or not and there's where you get into the the rulerships about exaltations and falls and debilities and so on Uh, but i think if you just go back to the basics keep it simple you can understand if neptune is associated with pisces a water sign Neptune is at home in water signs. Second of all, it's relatively at home in earth signs because it's harmonious with the water element. Neptune is out of place, so to speak, and I'm putting this in quotes, 
in air signs and fire signs. Well, I happen to have it in an air sign. And it doesn't mean that it's bad. It just is not in an element that's harmonious with the nature of the planet. Neptune happens to rule feelings. So does the moon, of course. But Neptune is there for a number of years in a particular sign. I have it in an air sign. And so you're beginning to, if you just stay with the basics, looking at the nature of the planet as you understand it and consider the rulerships of that planet and see if the sign that it's in when you're born, you don't even have to look in the books to know this, you can see whether this incredibly deep, transcendent archetype which is neptune is at home in the sign that it's in and second of all is it at home in the house that it's in i happen to have neptune for example in libra in my ninth house well already it's out of place it's in an air sign which is not harmonious with water signs one is the intellect one is the emotional nature if you're talking jungian archetypes let's say in analytical psychology so you have never i have neptune in an air sign and not only that it's in a fire house it's in the ninth house the natural house of sagittarius now is that a bad position no not at all it's simply that I happen to be a Libra as well, so I live in my intellect, and yet I have this planet, this watery collective archetype that has to do, it transcends all of these boundaries because it spends such a long time in this one sign, and Neptune is about dissolving apparent boundaries and barriers. So in the old books or in medical astrology, for example, you have someone like a Dr. William Davidson, who uh, was a, a medical astrologer, uh, a doctor, and um, he talks about Neptune representing a leak in the aura over the part of the body ruled by the sign that Neptune is in. Interesting. A leak in in the aura. So Neptune's position can suggest an area in your horoscope where you are permeable. And it, that means that you will tend in that area to be unconsciously, Neptune again, unconsciously aware of non-physical realities so that you will tend to have imagination for example i have my neptune conjunct my son so i'm aware of all of this in me i'm very aware of the collective side of me and that's really what i tune into when i'm an astrologer which of course is my whole life so there's that archetype of neptune for example uh, mars is a different planet it's a planet of action it is meant to express even its symbol a circle with an arrow pointing out away from it it's the symbol for males just as venus is the symbol for females and if you think think about the the basic archetypes of those two symbols the circle is the whole for example the, the whole of the circle of the of unity with the cross venus is the cross of matter below the the whole the circle of the whole mars used to be a cross of matter too and now we draw it like a little arrow but it used to be a cross except it was above the circle of the whole so in a male you have the physical genitalia which tell you embody the symbols men have an external penis that sticks out just like the symbol for mars women's reproductive organs are internal under the whole of matter if you follow me so that uh, you can look at the physiology even in these symbols so each of these archetypes represents these different kinds of processes and categories of energies if you will <clears throat> and then there's the the idea of uh whether you're talking about a collective planet or a personal planet because the inner planets from say jupiter on up to the moon the inner planets are personal they move faster and so they will have not less of a significance but a different kind of significance in the horoscope so it's never ever a matter of one planet 
canceling out another one. There, It's both and instead of either or. So when you're talking about strengths, it's certainly good to know. But rather than memorizing exaltations and falls and debilities and so on, uh, which you can do, but if you understand where those ideas of exaltation or fall come from, then you don't have to memorize it. It's because you understand. So if you if you just think your way through, as, as I do with Neptune, in her question, she was talking about Mars and Neptune and their relative strengths. Uh, that's uh, That's a big part of it is how long does that planet stay in a place neptune obviously moves very slowly and it's a a very subtle planet because of the slowness of the motion so you can look back in retrospect and see wow yeah through those years i was penetrating the veil so to speak i was really delving deep i was experiencing and, and understanding things that are transcending the the routine and mundane day-to-day experiences this is something else this energy this archetype so neptune is the door into not only a collective feeling of a generation of people but it's also a door into past lives for example uh, into dreams into imagination it's an enormously creative planet so i'm not sure if this is this is the beginning anyway of understanding that difference between what those planetary energies are and the more personal they are uh it they tend to be uh, more obvious Whereas you get into the collective planets, uh, and that's maybe a different story because they really do represent mass experiences, which is why you get into the rulerships of phenomena like earthquakes or natural disasters, for example, which very often will show up through the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in particular, so floods earthquakes, tornadoes, cyclones, and so on, these natural disasters that we're experiencing will affect you personally through the outer planets. If they are angular in your chart or strong in your chart, then you will directly experience those things. As you know, or maybe the the listeners know, I uh, lost my last condominium in the 1994 earthquake in Los Angeles. Well, you look at the old books and Neptune, among uh, Neptune and Uranus predominantly are prominent in earthquakes. And I have this at birth. Uh, And I have the whole configuration for all of that. I have Neptune exactly opposite my moon, the home, for example. Uh, I was not hurt in the earthquake, but I lost my condo in the earthquake. The whole building separated into two parts. So that kind of potential for uh, a direct experience of a collective phenomenon like an earthquake is very clear in a chart like mine because I was directly affected by it. So I'm not sure if this is clarifying or obfuscating your question but I'm, I'm i'm doing my best here to to just get a general appreciation of the difference between the planetary energies and, and the main point is nothing in astrology cancels out something else oh i have a square over here but look i have a trine over here so that cancels no it doesn't they both work they both work all the time now they may be in conflict with each other that's a different matter but they're not one doesn't cancel out the other and in terms of i think her question had to do is which one is stronger because this this one rules the night chart and this one rules the day chart and there are all, all these arcane rules that the the old books especially emphasize um that you can really get lost in if you just come back to the basics and just look at what that planet means to you and where it is and think a little bit about it pluto again is another planet it's an it's a water archetype because it's associated with scorpio and death itself is an it's a water sign phenomenon especially if you consider the natural eighth house ruler scorpio is a water sign it's your sign so that's i guess the the, my approach to cutting through all of that just think about the basics is pluto at home in a fire sign no it isn't i have it in leo but then a whole generation of us 
do. And so you have to take that into account too. This is Pluto is such a deep, deep, deeply emotional sign. Uh, and I, I, it's far transcendent of I'm happy or sad. I'm not talking about emotional, that kind of simplistic approach to it. It's a much more transcendent type of emotionality because at one point or another, all of us will experience death, which is a plutonic, scorpionic experience. And yet, uh, so it's an emotional experience, death is. And as you age, and trust me, I can see this and tell you, you be, I can already at this age feel it's a very slow, very gradual, almost imperceptible, increasing, I don't want to say disinterest in life. It's simply that I can already tell some of the details of living, just the mundane, mundane details of living, I am less and less interested in because they're less and less essential to me at this age. Uh, and that's, and so it's a, it's a gradual process. Other people now will die very slowly. Uh, my own father, for example, was terrified of dying and he died very slowly. Uh, my mother was not terrified of dying at all. And she died in her sleep and worked the last day of her life. So people's experiences of death are, are just as different as they experience life. I hope this is making sense. Yes, definitely. And thank you for the answers. So comprehensive. And folks, I think you get to see here what just one question with Robert can do. I'd like to just tell you a little personal of what I've done around this man's teaching. When I first heard Robert talking about solar arc predictions, I found home. I thought this guy is teaching astrology the way I want to learn it. So I started to digest everything I could. I got a bunch of recordings through the Kepler classes. I bought everything that was available of his that was for sale anywhere and just started making notes. I've mentioned this before. I put them into an electronic notes program on my computer so that I could search keywords. So I've built up signs and planets and houses and the whole synthesis. And then I just kept listening over and over. And thank goodness now we have this podcast as a resource so that you can do the same thing. And we're planning to cover a lot of and all of the same types of things so that over the various episodes of this podcast, you'll be able to hear how Robert puts a chart together. And I've been able to use it in my own life to make horary calls where I cast a chart to ask a question. I've had two situations here, not just in the recent past, where there were automobile accidents and I was able to go into the chart and look at the details of the accident. So there just are so many applications to this that you can use and apply from the style of teaching that Robert has put together for all of these years. Some of his synthesis, some of what he's learned from the old books, some of what he learned from Linda Goodman, all combined, and that's what we're sharing here. Now, if you'd like to talk to Robert, he is available for readings, the information for that. And we have a great follow-up group in our Discord channel led by Kristen Lawhead. And that's also in the show notes as well, plus a link to his books that are on Amazon. So there's a great resource there if you check out the show notes. We'll be back with more. Leave us a question if you have one. We would appreciate if you would like the podcast, if you like what we're doing. Give us a good comment and a five-star review on iTunes. That helps keep our ranking up there with the superstars of astrology podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock.